courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Hello, Bow River. We are not tonight in the sphere, but we're in the second best place where there's cold beer. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And tonight we've got the third member of our team who's never been seen before, Peter Marino, helping us out on tech. So thanks for everyone that's come out. We're expecting some more people just as the draft gets going here. Kind of crazy to see all these faces on the screen. But uh, Matt, big night for all these kids, right? Oh, yes. And it'll be interesting to see, especially with the Flames picking twice in this first round, uh, who they end up selecting. Looks like the Sharks are coming up to make the first pick. Is there any doubt in your mind that the first pick is Celebrini? No. After that, though, it's is where things get uh, interesting. We've profiled in the past that we think the Flames are probably waiting for a Ginla to be picked. Matt, do you think he's going to be available now? He might be. Uh, there's a bunch of rumors about a whole bunch of different players uh, around for various picks, so it'll be interesting to see how it exactly unfolds. And tonight we get to see all the new Fanatics jerseys. The uh, jersey company for the NHL has changed. We will see the new jerseys tonight. I think there's only two teams that have actually changed their design, and that's the two California teams. So we'll see those, but everyone else, it'll look slightly, uh, slightly different, but pretty much the same look. I think we've already seen the Flames unveiled. Um, don't expect a lot of change there. And it looks like from what they're holding in San Jose's hand, pretty much the same as well. And first things first, got to congratulate the Florida Panthers on uh, defeating the Oilers and preventing the darkest of timelines. That's right. <laughs> there you go. They deserve some cheers for that, right? They, they, did, <laughs> uh, they did the dirty work that needed to be done. I loved afterwards when Kachuk said, for all the fans in Calgary, I couldn't let uh, Edmonton win. That was a great quote. Oh, wow. Joe Thornton has still got the beard in retirement. Still looks homeless uh, as much as ever. <laughs> Surprising that he's making the pick and not career. There we go. Macklin Celebrini taking number one. The guy everyone expected. The Flames will be drafting ninth today. And 28th as it sits now. They may move around. Um, but we will be... Why don't we start with the latest news? And For those that are here, if you're interested, we have another mic across the table. If you want to chat about any of these topics, feel free to jump in. We'll bring you on the show. We'll chat with you. Um, and we'd love to hear whatever you have to say. But Matt, why don't we start with the latest news? Yesterday, the Flames made a trade. The Calgary Flames yesterday traded Andrew Mangiapane away to the Washington Capitals in exchange for a 2025 second-round pick. Honestly, I'm surprised here that there's no salary retention for a deal like that. Like, I was expecting that for somebody to take on $5.5 million, the Flames would have to pay somebody to do that. Does that surprise you? Oh, very much so. And with the trade coming about that way, like it, I can understand why Conroy didn't wait for the trade deadline. I don't understand Just what, jump on it right there. Yeah, I mean, if someone's going to offer you that, take it now, right? Because it may not be available at the deadline, but... I'm surprised that Washington's willing to make that deal. Exactly. And the Flames now open up a roster spot, whether it's a new player coming via trade or free agency, um, that they could parlay into other picks or other roster flexibilities moving forward. For sure. And, you know, I think the Flames are very winger heavy, right? They've been winger heavy for a number of years. We even said that coming into this, that they had way too many wingers. And as we look at getting... Uh, Peltier spot, as we look at getting Coronado a spot, those are both guys that are better wingers. I think even Zari a better winger, right? We saw him Well, the- even uh, Sharon Govich, who played most of the year at center, like he's traditionally a winger too. Yeah, and- so they, they needed to open up at least one wing spot, um, and they've done that now. But I'm impressed that Conroy was able to get a second for him. Yeah. And technically that's Colorado's second next year that, uh, that the Capitals were in possession of, so it'll be a late second. Yeah, it'll probably be in the 60 range, but a second's a second. Yep. And, you, you know, if the difference was a third this year or a second next year, I'd probably take the second next year. And, I mean, even if they don't make the pick, right, they've got so many picks already that even if they were to trade the pick for a player, it's still a valuable asset. I mean, if we just look at this year alone, the Flames draft 9th, 28th, 44th, 62nd, 74th, 84th, 106th, 107th, and 170th. Like, you know, I think next year they've got almost the same number of picks. So this is going to be a couple years where they they might have more draft capital they can use. 
So you could turn that into another roster player, even that would be a good deal. Yeah, and having 16 picks in the next three years in the top three rounds, like you're not going to want to have all of those picks being made necessarily by the Flames. Yeah. Just because the competition and... There's only so many spots, right? Yeah, and you want to have make sure that your coaching staff is able to properly develop each of the players, and that's hard when you're basically dealing with two drafts worth of players every draft. Matt, do you think it's fair to say at this point that Andrew Mangiapane is probably in his last best earning year in the NHL? He's probably not going to get anywhere near $5 million on whoever signs him after this? Unless he bounces back with Washington, which is, could very well happen. Um, the last guy we sent to Washington we were worried would bounce back. Matthew Phillips really didn't do anything. Yeah. Uh, it's one of those where... For Manjapani, he's in the perfect spot for him to possibly bounce back because Washington's kind of a quasi-playoff team. And, you know, if he has a good year, he'll get it paid. If he doesn't, then... Going back to the draft here, I'm noticing Celebrini wearing 71. I think that's the first time I've ever seen a player not wear the year on their jersey. They always put 24 on it. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause, uh, and even the graphic they showed had 24 on it. I don't think I've ever seen them actually give the player his number. Yeah, that is weird. But, you know, the only, the, the interesting thing for Mangiapane, if you look, he could end up playing with Ovechkin very easily on that team. Oh, for and sure. And that's a way that you could see him easily get his numbers up if he's playing with Ovechkin. Well, I remember uh, old former Flame Chris Clark scoring 30 goals for that one year with playing yeah. out with Ovechkin. So. And I think Washington's a weird destination because they're a team that feels like they need to be rebuilding. And to be taking on NHL contracts, it almost feels like they're doing this once more for Ovi. Pretty much. And you see the same thing with the Pittsburgh Penguins, that they're not going to tank and rebuild until all of their guys are done. And then, you know, they'll, they'll probably be terrible for five or six years, much like the Blackhawks were after losing Taze and Kane. And I wanted to start today by talking about Mondrapani because I think it reminds us the depth that we need in the draft. I mean, Mondrapani was a six-round pick. You're lucky if a six-round pick gets a pro contract, much less play six full seasons for the team that drafted them, or six full seasons league at all. So while we're all excited today to see the Flames pick twice in the first, we've got a six-round pick. We've got a couple fours. I mean, Johnny Goudreau is a fourth-round pick, right? So we need to remember that that depth in the draft can be the thing that's going to help this team going forward. So we have to remember that, you know, if we can find him in the sixth, who knows who we're going to find this year. We need to treat all those picks as potential NHLers. Yep, and that's why the important thing is having as many picks as possible, like the Flames have managed over the last year uh, to restock the cover. And even one of the players that everyone's most excited about, Dustin Wolf, seventh round, right? Yeah. I mean, the guy they just made a move to get on the roster. Why don't we discuss that one, too, while we're talking about trades? Uh, Mangi or uh, Markstrom traded before the Mangiapane deal. This was one we've been talking about for a year or more, right? I mean, we, you and I were talking last season about, do we move Markstrom? Do we not? Rumors heated up around the deadline. They finally moved him off to uh, the New Jersey Devils, retaining 31% of his salary, which is roughly $2.2 million. To complete the deal, they got Kevin Ball, next year's first-round pick, which is top 10 protected, in return. What do you think of the return on this? Uh, anytime you can add a six foot six, 230-pound defenseman, that's a good... Good trade. And uh, Ball, he's not the most physical of guys. He won't fight very much or anything like that. But uh, you, you do need guys that can clear out the front of the net. And if Ball can get a little bit more tenacity and nastiness in this game, then you know he could be a perfectly viable like 4-5 or five guy for this team moving forward. I've heard a lot of people say Kevin who, and I think that if... Flames can develop. I think he's going to be a top four because, I mean, we've got what? We've got Uyghur, we've got Anderson, we maybe have Shillington. He's not signed yet. And Ball, like, that's going to be your top four for sure. Yeah. This could be like the defense Sharon Govich, right? A guy that comes in that nobody knows who they are, comes on a team where he's given an opportunity, uh, and he, he excels. Yeah, and frankly, when I first heard the trade, I'm like, oh, did I go on a time warp when the Flames got Kevin Dahl back in the early 90s? But... Uh, Kevin Dahl was a much worse player. Yes. <laughs> yes, he was. So, I don't know. And, and, I mean, if anyone wants to jump in here and chat about their thoughts on the trade, there's been a lot of people online that said, really, that's all the Flames could get? I think we have to remember here, 
the goalie had a, a no trade, right? He decided where he's going to go and when he's going to go. It's not like they had 32 teams they could talk to. But I also have some interesting stats here. He's, uh, there's only been three goalies, age 30 or older. They've been traded in the last 15 years who were starters. Markstrom is the oldest at the time of the trade, but if we look back at them, um, Miller and Ott were traded to St. Louis for a first, a third, Halak, Stewart, and Carrier. Darcy Cumper was traded to Colorado for a first, a third, and Timmins. And now Markstrom traded to New Jersey for a first and ball. So really, if you look over 15 years at the cost of a 30-plus starter, it's about market value. Yeah, and looking at that, like Markstrom was also the oldest of the three at the time exactly. of the trade. So, you know, and the fact that it's in keeping exactly with everything else, the Perfect. Um, we have the second round, the second overall pick here was just made by Chicago. I can't remember the last time an active player has made a pick. Can you? Well, when you have Connor Bedard, I think that's a good selling feature. Yeah, McDavid never went up and made a pick. Yeah. And Artem Lovshunov was uh, drafted second drafted overall. Drafted second, so Iggy's still on the board, Iggy Jr. Uh, we'll see what happens at third. But anyway, going back to the Marsham deal, like, you know, I, I think that people that are upset with this deal – have to again remember the age of Markstrom and the fact that since he's been a flame, he's been pretty much on one year, off one year. The flame sold him high. Right? Yeah, Who exactly. knows what it'll be next year? Well, and uh, I remember our conversation last year was talking about maybe having to buy him out or because yeah. his con uh, his play and his contract really did not line up too well. So um, the fact that he had a bounce back year, it made perfect sense to move him. And, you know, uh, having Vladar and Wolf is a perfectly viable tandem for a young rebuilding team. Yeah, I mean, we don't know if Vladar is, uh, you know, is going to be healthy or not. We have yet to hear him cleared. But I think that, and you've heard me say it a lot on the podcast, and everyone that's here and has listened to it for a while, I still think that we haven't, we don't know what Dan Vladar is. He's played less than 100 NHL games. He could be a starter. He could be a backup. He could be, you know, the next David Riddick, who I think was overrated in his spot. We'll find out, but I think that this is a year to find that out. And it's also a year, thankfully, that the Flames don't need to rush Wolf into a 50-game season. Right? Wins are not important at this point. Development is important at this point. So even if they take Wolf and they play him in 30 games, 40 games, and he gets 20 wins in those, but he's developing, that's the important thing. They don't need to take this rookie and try to you know get 50 wins in a playoff appearance. Yeah, and realistically, I could see the Flames signing a, a guy like Phoenix Copley or Martin Jones or Ilya Samsonov just as a stopgap, like, third guy in case... Uh, well, Lodar's you know who's out of a job now? It's Capo Kakinen, because he's the third goalie in New Jersey, and they're probably not going to bring him back. Yeah, th there are plenty of options, so... And, you know, I think if you're the Flames, you probably will end up bringing in a... Uh, a veteran, if for no other reason than you want to push those two guys, right? Mm -hmm. You want to push them to make sure that they're not just getting the job because they're there. I mean, let's be honest. Oscar Dansk, who's right now third on the depth chart, is not a viable you no. know, number two. And while Terry Ignatiju is uh, going to be the uh, bully with the Wranglers next year making his... Potentially uh, also an ECHL starter. You know, and it's one of those where, like, the Flames don't really have a ton of guys for the Wranglers either, so having a third string guy uh, to play that kind of rover between the Flames and the Wranglers yep. isn't a bad idea either. Yeah, and I think there's a number of sort of veteran guys you could bring in who, if they clear waivers, great. If they don't, that's fine too. But if they do, you can send them down to the Wranglers, get that you know veteran number one guy from there, and then, you know, if you need them, you know you've got them. Now we're about to see the Ducks pick. We're seeing on the screen their their new old logo. Um, this is the the new ver or the revised version of the original. What do you think? Uh, I prefer the eggplant and uh, jade color. I like the orange eyes. I yes. think that's cool. The apparently, the, if you look on the stick of the Duck logo, uh, the tape is supposed to be a W for Wild Wing, their mascot. I think this is the more fierce looking version of their jersey. And I like that they're going to go orange. You'll see it on the stage here. Like, I've thought for years, the NHL is too much black. There's too many well, teams. I know. And, like, that's part of the reason why, like, I like the yeah. purple with them. But, uh, you know, with uh, it's Utah It's weird to see orange in, helmets, though, too. Yeah. With Utah coming in, like, I wouldn't mind them going with a non-traditional color scheme. 
Um, we know what their colors are for the first year, and we'll see their jersey for the first time tonight. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think the orange is going to look cool. I mean, I wish they, like you, I wish they'd go back to the eggplant, but if not, I think the orange is going to be a nice change. I agree. Um, and, and I like the, they finally given eyes to their their jersey, so we'll get to see that here in a few seconds. Um, L.A., the other, the only other team that's really changing the jerseys this year, and we'll see them in a little bit, too, going back to the, the early 90s. The 90s version. Gretzky look. So we will we'll get to see that here shortly, um, but anyway, going back to the the goalie discussion, like the you've said this before that the Flames need to draft a goalie every year, right? Now we've got Wolf and Wolf's turning pro, and there's really nobody right behind him. And goalies sometimes turn out, sometimes don't, right? You never know. So if you can get at least one in the system every year, you've got a way better chance. And I mean, look at how many years we drafted goalies. Everyone from McDonald to Irving to um, you know, who is the guy who didn't get his COVID shot? Parsons. Yeah. Um, you know, and none of them turned out. No. So, you know, we need, and now the seventh round guy is turning out. So so we really need to just take a, a goalie every year. Well, and you see, like, with uh, Nashville, like, they, they got their version of Dustin Wolf and UC Soros. Yep. But then they went out and got Askarov as well. And, you know, in the next couple of years, I would not be surprised if there's a good goaltender that the Flames might not use another higher end draft pick to get, uh, you know, fully round out the... Last time they used a high end pick, they got Brent Cron, so it better be a better decision than that. True. You know, and not trade got, up. You they know, got, what, get McDonald in the second yeah. round? Yeah. So that hasn't worked out Parsons too well Parsons, too. Uh, yeah, yeah, Parsons like a lot. was too. Irving was the first two, yeah. Trevor Kidd so trading maybe, up maybe, to... maybe we should <laughs> stick to drafting them late. True. Um, and we're about to see the Ducks here hand out their new jersey. Um, again, that new orange jersey that they've got, which it's going to be weird. I, I thought that they would wear black helmets with it, but the fact that they're orange, I think, is interesting. And they oh wow, Bennett the second Seneke Be Beckett going Seneke third. from uh, wow, that's Osho. a reach. That is a reach. Like he was rated in the teens. And it's interesting too, right? Because now everybody you know is frantically changing their list, going, "Who's still available?" For those listening later and aren't here tonight, we had a lot of. Uh, Surprise in the brewery. Back at Senegi going third. There's a guy you profiled, the potential Flames pick at nine. Yeah, well, and I thought, like, they might be able to trade down to and still be able to get this player. So the fact that he went to third is just... It, it's an interesting pick by the Ducks. It's not a bad pick. It's just... Well, it, it's a little weird, because you look at uh, Demidov, who's the other really good player, Demidov is a better player than Seneki. The only difference really is, is that one's Russian and one's Canadian. And, you know, like, to me, the higher-end skill wins out for me. And yeah, Seneke, but there's still organizations that don't want to take the Russian guys so true. high. True. It, it just it seems like a strange decision there by the go. Ducks because they the could have... Uh, Traded down, perhaps, and still got the same guy. They have Seneki's name on the jersey. Yeah, you can't trade down. The pick's locked in. Um, just, just a odd pick by them. You know, and it's interesting. You're mentioning trading down. So we talked about this last week. Of should the Flames trade up? Should the Flames trade down? And the question always becomes, what is the cost to trade up or down? And we kind of have that cost decided now. If we take a look earlier today, the Montreal Canadiens and the Los Angeles Kings made a trade. Uh, Montreal traded, uh, essentially got pick 21, four pick 26, and also to throw in 57 and 198. So to move five places, it cost them a second and a seventh. So Matt, knowing that, is there any player here that you think would be worth that kind of cost for the Flames? No, you know, it's going to not... cost even more to jump into higher in the top 10. Well, it depends. Like, with the Flames' top 10 pick, I would not no. bother uh, because regardless, even, you're going to get a great player I at 9. I wouldn't pay that cost to move from 28 to like 22. And uh, it depends on how much and how weird the draft is. Um, like, you might be able to get one of the guys in your top 22 at 28. Um, like, we saw that when the Flames selected Connor Zari, they ended up yep. trading down twice and getting the player they wanted anyway. Trading down is one thing, but in this case, yeah, I mean, if you're trading down, you're going to get those assets, right? But yeah. I don't want the Flames to give those up 
to move yeah, forward. It, it depends on If somebody exactly. wants to give us that to take our spot, I'm happy to take their second and their seventh. Yeah, like, there, there's only a small drop from, like, 20 to, like, 30, and then from 30 to 40. Like, it's it, very much in the same class of guys. Uh, so, like, I would not even be opposed if the Flames decide to trade down from 28 to, say, 33 or 34 if they got an additional second round pick as well, just because of so why trade not? out of the first to the early second and then get another pick in the second for it. No. It, yeah. Just because everybody in the latter half of the first round just seems to be in that decent but not great type prospect. And you know, the more darts you can throw at that point is you know, I think is a better idea. Yeah, no, I can totally see that. So, yeah, I mean, we've, we'll save some of these topics for later in the night because we've got more to do. But with the Markstrom deal, with the uh, Mangiapane deal now done, how are you feeling now about sort of the Flames coming into this draft? Do you expect we're going to see a lot of movement? Do you think we're going to see them stand pat at this point? Well, to the me... The two it, players they were looking to move were moved. Yeah, and to me, like, if I'm Craig Conroy, like, my idea is... The, the Flames are entirely open for business. And if there's anybody over the age of 25 or 26 that you really want off of our team, we can make it happen. It just, the price tag needs to be met, just like the Mangiapane yeah. deal, just like the Markstrom deal. And, you know, and if that means, like, the Flames taking on a bad contract, like a Jeff Skinner or I, insert I, I, name of overpaid guy here, that's perfectly viable. I think at this point, Craig Conroy is probably doing his best Fraser Crane impression. He's listening. Yes, exactly. I don't exactly. think he's making a lot of calls, but I think he's going to be listening to everything. I don't think he's actively shopping anybody else. No. And the two guys you need to shop have been moved. But if you want to call him, he's going to be open to listening to pretty much anything. I can't think of really anybody here that would be unmovable at this point besides Wolf. Yeah, and like, you know, if somebody came with a great deal for Blake Coleman, are you going to say no to that? And no, I mean, there's me, no like, trades no. in place and stuff like that, but yeah, as long as it fits all the parameters, you're going to take it. And it's one of those things that having like $30 million in cap space, like that is a very weaponizable asset. And like the Flames are actually under the cap floor with the full roster, so... You know, like, they're going to have to take on some salary regardless. Well, that's interesting, too, that you mentioned that. Because, yeah, they have $30 million to spend right now. They have a full roster. Like, we see some teams like, oh, they have $30 million to spend, but they've got half a roster assigned. The Flames could feel the team today with the players they have. And be fine. <laughs> yeah, so $30 million is a lot of money. Like, they're going to have to take that on. You mentioned Jeff Skinner. I think that's some – remember when the Flames had to trade Monaghan and we had to give up first to get Montreal to take him? I think you're going to be yeah, in a reverse and, Monahan scenario this year. Yeah, and, somebody's and, and, and frankly, like that would be a good way to neutralize that trade in your log, so to speak, is to yeah. just you know do the same thing in reverse now that we're on the opposite side I of the agree. coin. So that way, both get eliminated and you can just carry on. The Blue Jackets are on the clock. We'll see you get to join Johnny Goudreau in a couple of years. I wonder now if Johnny's still happy with that move further away from a cup than he was here. But he's closer to family. That was the important thing. Let's see who the Blues select. From Medicine Hat of the Tiege. WHL. Nope. Nope. Oh, Kate Kate Lindstrom. Lindstrom. Oh. So Tiege still on the board. I feel like we're doing Tiege Watch today. Yep. Um, yeah, so he'll be potentially joining Johnny. I mean, Johnny's Line mate might be out of there. We've heard some rumors, so uh, they might be looking for another high-end player. I'm actually a little bit surprised at the Lindstrom pick um, at four. I had him going like seventh or eighth, so good for the Blue Jackets. Uh, yeah, once the, again, uh, the guy's uh, reaching for forwards, it seems. Quite the shiny suit jacket. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's interesting, you know, we knew this year that the draft was unpredictable after probably two. And we're seeing that already, right? We're starting to see that, you know, yeah, we're, we're getting guys who aren't expected to go this high going this high. And you've got to imagine now that all the scouts on the floor are having to quickly change those lists because, oh, wow, a guy we thought was not going to be available now is. Well, especially with the, the high-end defensemen, usually those are the type of guys that you see going early. Yeah. and. Like, the, there's four really good defensemen still available with yeah, four picks between 
now in the flames. So, like, either the flames get a Ginla or they get one of the four good defensemen. Yeah, I mean, we're five picks from the flames now. So, yeah, so yeah. realistically, looking at it, like, you're going to get either Demidoff, a Ginla, or one of the good defensemen. Sounds four like a band, defensemen. a Ginla and the four defense. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's really what's what's there, right? Is four really good defensemen and and uh, a Gimla's kid. That's kind of cool. They've got the signature on there. I've never I've never seen that. But this is a very different presentation tonight. In the honestly, I would not be opposed if the NHL did this in Vegas every year and just made it like a one location for the draft. I can't imagine that the teams make a lot of money hosting the draft. No. Like, it's probably given out for free to season ticket holders and stuff like that. Well, um, usually it's just uh, friends and family with very few actual people going. Usually the second level is, uh, is for sale. Yeah. So they'd probably give it to ticket season ticket people. But, yeah, I mean, it doesn't make a lot of money. I think doing it there would be fine. But they've already announced this to be the last year that they're going to do it in person. After this, they're going to go NFL style. Yeah, well, it does make sense because it does cost a lot to fly out each team's uh, entire scouting department to the actual draft. Well, not floor. just not just to bring them up, but then you've got to turn them around, and you like you know they got free agency starting Monday. Yeah. So you've got to send them all home, get them all ready, get them back into your war room, and get going again. Like it makes sense, just stay home for them. Well, Matt, I think at this point we've got the Canadians. This is the team that was rumored to take Teach. Um, if if he's still on the board after this pick, I think he's going to fall to nine. Yeah. This is the team that people assumed. Might take T.J. Ginla, if not the Flames. He, I think he said that he had an interview with them um, in one of his media availabilities, so we'll see if they're going to take a Ginla here. But I think that they'll probably take one of the defensemen. Yeah, they were very high on Demidoff, too. So it's one of those where, yeah, Montreal's a very much a wild card, and it could very much be that they take a Ginla with this pick. But I would not be more surprised if they didn't go with the defenseman just knowing their draft situation yeah. uh, with the, their prospect pool. Like, they need good D-men. And then after them is Utah. I'm, I don't like these new Fanatics hats this year. I'm, I don't like the badge look on them that we're seeing. But um, we'll, we'll see if we'll see if again the gets taken here. And then after we see the fifth pick, we'll take a bit of a break until the Flames pick at nine. Matt, do you, if the Flames, and we, I know we talked about this on the show, but if the Flames end up taking a D-man at 9, do they take a D-man again at 28? Are you looking for positional need at this point? Uh, it, I think with uh, 28, regardless, it's uh, best player available. Um, and it just so happens that this draft is very much more defense heavy. Yeah. So I would not be surprised if it was a double D uh, with the first two picks, if that's the case. Yeah, because we have to remember that even if they pick the best available, that player is not going to be in the NHL for at least three years. So what you need now might not be what you need three years. It'd be three years from now. Well, and especially with the Flames just entering a rebuild this year, um, to do it right, it's easy to plug and play like a top five pick forward into yep. your lineup pretty much right away. Um, but it, a defenseman usually takes three or four years minimum to get NHL ready. And if the Flames are going to stock up on a specific position this year, it should be defensemen just so that way they can get the cooking done by the time they can plug and play. Yeah. You know, I mean, they've got, they've got a lot of defensemen. I wouldn't say they have a lot of valuable NHL defensemen. Right? No, like they're, Maybe they're trying to, yeah, they're trying to fill the number three, four, five, six yeah. spots. With, well, I think with all their guys. Three's filled with ball now. Yeah. But, well, like, even organizationally, like, yeah. uh, uh, Grushnikov and, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah. uh, the, and all the various other guys. He'll be around for a while. Yeah. Like, um, all those other guys. Like, yeah. it, you're kind of hoping that those guys fill out the bottom end of your roster. They still need, like, the star defenseman. That's true. And whether right. that's their. Speaking first... of defensemen, are you surprised that Schilling is still not signed? No, and honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if the Flames just went uh, to free agency and got somebody else. You think so? I, to me, like if it's not done by now, like it should be done by now. I agree. And so, if it's not done, it, yeah, I'm thinking that they're going to just. The go only thing I can else. think is the agent says we want to see what other deals are out there. Yeah. Right. I mean, it doesn't mean he won't come back, but. We've talked about on the show. We don't know what he is, right? He's missed yeah, a couple and years. realistically, the Flames have so many guys that are in that generic pool to choose from that 
you know, Shillington is not necessarily more special no. than anybody else. No, but he's a known commodity. Yeah. All right, let's see what the pick is at five. Ken Hughes, the general manager, making the pick. And we'll see who they take. Oh, of course, I've got to do it in both languages. Who is? Celine Dion is making Oh, wow, pick. Celine Dion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess their pick will go on, right? Yeah. <laughs> She, well, she lives in Vegas. They're in Vegas. It makes sense. <laughs> Let's hope that uh, she's not going to sing anything here. Thankfully, we have this muted in the, That's the right. bar right now. So If she busts a note, we'll have them turn the, the audio on. But You know you're desperate when you're trying to make Draft Weekend special by bringing Celine Dion on stage. And it's not the 1990s. <laughs> I mean, if the Flames did that, are you going to bring out Terry Vader? Like... Bret Hart? Like, do we really need a celebrity to come out and make our pick? She, pr she probably doesn't even know who she's announcing here. But she's back in pop culture because I guess there's a new uh, Amazon Prime documentary about her, so that's probably why. It's a promotional thing. Well, she walked to the stage. She can walk. I'm not even a hockey mom, she says. Okay. That's right. I'm not even a hockey mom, but they paid me a lot of money to come make the pick, so here I am. It looks like she didn't rehearse this. And it is not T.J. Gimla. They've taken Ivan Demidov, which Matt predicted. So that means Tej will probably now fall to nine. All right, we are at pick number eight in the draft, and uh, for those listening later, you already know, but Tej Aginla now off the board. Tej Aginla, historically, is the first pick ever made by the Utah Hockey Club, as they're called. So not coming to Calgary. Carter Yakimchuk taking it uh, just after him at seven, a hitman prospect off the board, which leaves the Flames now to pick somebody else. Matt, are you surprised that Tej is going to Utah? Yeah, that would... I was not really surprised. Uh, I thought Utah would want to make a splash in the biggest name available. If you want to get, but he's not going to be available for a couple of years. I mean, if you want to make a splash, go get Stamkos. True. It's just... Yeah. And let... It's, Vegas Frank, is not really going to wear just a black jersey with Utah on it, right? Like, yeah. Well, it, it's one of those that, like, Anaheim, Ottawa, and Utah all kind of reached for their picks, yeah. so uh, much to the Flames' benefit because there are two really good defensemen, and we're up two picks from now. So you and I have had this debate for a long time. I think it's best for Teach to go somewhere else. I mean, if we take the Aginla name out and just say his name is Teach Smith, I don't know that the Flames need another forward right now. Well, especially a winger. Like realistically, the team needs centers and defensemen centers, first and second. Defense, yeah. Uh, but um, Tej, uh, just due to how his uh, overall game was why I was high on him, uh, much like Kachuk, but um, it's one of those where uh, the Flames like now are firmly in the get a good defenseman camp, and we'll see. And if anyone wants to uh, come and give their thoughts on Tej being taken, feel free. We got an extra mic here, but... You know, I'm not going to say Tej Aginla will never be a flame. I think that that's too much to say. I think, as I've said, I think developing another market where you don't have dad's number above you, especially when you're playing for the Wranglers, right? Playing for the Wranglers and having dad's number there, I think is a lot of pressure. Kachuk worked out. I don't know if Kachuk would have worked out in St. Louis, right? I don't know if Domi would have worked out in Toronto. Like, I think these guys do better when they're away from dad. But come that first UFA year or even RFA year, I wouldn't be surprised if he comes here. Unless we see him... Paul Lindros refused to play there, and he has to get traded to Calgary. Mm -hmm. I can't see it happening. But, uh, yeah, I, I, of all the teams, I wasn't expecting Utah to take him. That was actually the team I was most expecting to really? take him. So I'm not entirely surprised. It's just disappointing as a Flames fan yeah. to not have it, another again literature. So at this point, then, I mean, it's got to be a 
defenseman, right? I would assume so. Like, uh, Berkeley Catan is still there. But realistically, the Flames need a defenseman. Yakimchuk would have been fun just because he's a hitman prospect. Um, you know, but if he's off the board, yeah, there's a couple other guys um, that, that could be taken. We'll see who gets taken here at, uh, at 8. And then the Flames are at 9. You mentioned when we weren't recording here, Matt, the possibility of potentially having the Flames uh, trade down since they can't get Teach. What do you think of that as a possibility? Let's say they say, you know, we can't get Teach. Let's move down to eleven. Well, it depends. Um, like, it, if they have two or three guys that are more or less equal on their list, and a team wants to throw us an asset to move down a pick or two, do you take uh, pretty much any asset at that point. If you're getting like a second mid second round pick, sure, why not? Yeah, I don't know if you're getting the second to move down two. I think I'd take anything over a fourth. Well, realistically, like there was a trade earlier in the week where uh, Buffalo uh, moved down from 11 to 14, and they got a second-round pick at, like, I think, 41 or 40. Well, even today, or so, uh, yeah, today, right, Montreal moved down five and got a second and a seventh. But so, that, that was also, yeah, that was also a mid-20s pick, so it probably cost more in this early. All right, the Seattle Kraken make their pick, and then the Flames are up after that. Looks like yeah, the, the next uh, handful of picks... Uh, this guy looks like a sailor with his white pants. Um, they have, there are a bunch of uh, left-handed shooting defensemen, uh, Sam Dickinson, Zeev Buyum, um, and uh, Anton Soleyev, and a right-shot guy, Zane Perrick. And we profiled a lot of these guys in our last episodes. If you want to pause here, go back to our last episode, and you can hear Matt's uh, scouting report on a lot of these guys. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Flames ended up taking Perrick because uh, they actually invited him, his bro older brother, to the Flames development camp uh, in a week. So. And that's the thing, right? Is you're you're oh, often Berkeley Caton went eighth overall. Berkeley Caton is off the board now. You're often looking when you're drafting here for the human being, right? I mean, they all have similar talent, so you're really looking at the human being and what do these guys, what are they, and what do we know about them? And like you said, his brother came here, so they would know the family well. And especially the Flames have always said that's important to them, is the interviews, getting to know these kids, bringing them into Calgary, that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm frankly shocked at all the forwards that are going uh, in the top ten. I was figuring it was going to lean more D-heavy, but... Um, you know, if you look at a lot of these markets, though, they need a name. And it's a lot easier to sell a forward to the fans than a defenseman. True. It's just interesting that uh, things are breaking out that way. Because realistically, of the uh, big three defensemen, Perrick, William, and Levshunov, only Levshunov, who was taken second overall, was taken. The other two guys are still on the board at nine. And, you know, like uh, Dickinson's a perfectly reasonable choice, as is Saleh. Mm -hmm. You know, like the Flames could trade down a couple of spots and still have a really good defenseman on the board. Well, the Flames are going to be on the clock here soon, so if they're... If a trade's coming in, we're going to know in the next few seconds here. Yeah, because um, uh, Batman will be saying, oh, we have a trade to that's announce. That's right, we have a trade to announce. And I was hoping we'd have a soundboard piece in case there was a trade that we could play Batman's audio tonight, but we don't. So I'll do my best Batman impression. Luckily, there's some room on these mic cables so I can get on my knees and see things from Batman's perspective. Yep. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see what the Flames do here. Wh who they're taking and and um, you know what they end up what they end up doing with with this pick it's it could go a lot of different directions and now we see the flames logo up there we'll get to see their new fanatics jersey which again doesn't look a lot different than the old one um, Jerome McGinley we saw in the crowd earlier with his son Teach he's not at the flames table at least not for round one. So that'll mean we'll probably have Conroy go up, we'll probably have uh, Todd Button, head scout, go up, and we'll see who else goes on stage with them. It'll be very interesting to see exactly what the Flames do. Yeah, the Flames are on the clock uh, now. You know, they have literally their choice of all the good demons, so, you know, a perfect spot for the Flames uh, right now. The only one of the four that I'd be a little bit concerned if they took would be uh, Soleyev, just because him being like six foot seven and already man sized, 
um, that he might be dominating his league just due to just the fact. Just because of that, yeah. Uh, sort of like how Tyler Myers was awesome, and then he gets to the NHL as the third pairing guy. Yeah, and I mean, we've seen him take guys like Keaton Kanzig because he was big, and whatever happened to Keaton Kanzig, no one's heard from him in years. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely some, uh, some challenges that could come with that. When you said man size, that t- gave me a flashback to Tree Living, right? Every year at rookie camp, we hear him talk about. You know, man sized and not yet man sized, and it's, it's, um, a, it's a nod back to tree. I was making a call back to that. There so. you go, yeah, it's, it's a nod back to tree. All right, the Flames uh, pick at this point will be in, or at least we'll see it on the graphic in just a second here that the Flames pick. I love that they change the whole stage to each team's colors. And that's probably the only time we'll ever see the Flaming Sea that big in Vegas. Enjoy it. Well, we will later. Tonight, That's true, but... 28th again, but <laughs> by then no one's going to be looking. It'll be darker, you'll see it better, but no one will be looking at it then. And we don't even know if we will, right? I mean, for all we know, they might trade that pick away. Conroy does not seem pleased. It just flashed him up on the screen, and he was not very happy. Conroy's anymore. always happy. I know. So seeing him a little bit in grumpy mode was... A lot, a lot of nerves. Yeah. This is really his first draft, right, as GM. So probably a lot of nerves there. Oh, this is cool. They're even showing the team's top point guys on the screen. I've never seen that before. That's a neat presentation. Getting some cheers here at Bow River Brewing for Coleman. All right, and it says the Flames are on the clock, but they haven't said the pick is locked in yet, so it makes me wonder if there's been some movement. This is the Flames' first top ten pick since they took Matthew Kachuk. The last time the Flames selected ninth overall, they took Dion Phaneuf in 2003. Not a bad pick. No. The one before that was Brent Cron, so we'll just ignore that one. <laughs> that was in Calgary? Yes. To Calgary in Calgary. All right, Connie, are you going to get up or have you made a trade? What are we doing here? It's uh, Connie's first draft. I don't know if he knows he's supposed to go to the stage or not. All right, somebody's ushering him up. Here we go. They did not trade the pick. They're going to make it. The Flames getting up on the stage. And let's see who they end up picking. Oh, I didn't think anyone had a jersey there, but no, someone does have a jersey. That's good. All right, Craig Conroy at the podium. we got to be careful putting Conroy at the podium. This is a guy who likes to talk. He could be doing this all night if they give him the time. Start telling stories of him and Jerome and the 4 team. It'll be 9.30 when pick 10 gets made. And from the Memorial Cup champion, Saginaw Spirit, they've taken Zane Perrick. Zane Perrick. Matt, you've seen more of this guy than a lot of people here. What do you think of the Zane Perrick pick? Uh, basically, he is Evan Bouchard. Uh, he has a, got a one dynamite uh, slap shot. Uh, he had 90 points. Very uh, offensive D-man. Yeah, he is not a defensive defenseman in any way, shape, or form. But that's, but, that's uh, what's hot right now, right? The offensive yeah. D-man or whatever one's trying to take. Yeah, and uh, I, as I said, like the Flames already invited his older brother, so it kind of telegraphed this pick a bit. Um, it, it's the most points by a defenseman in the OHL since Ryan Ellis in 2010-2011. So, uh, very good offensive defenseman, and we'll see. Well, the pick is in. We're watching Zane Perrick uh, get his Flames jersey. All right, we are back now in the mid-20 pick. We have two questions from Callum in Vancouver who wrote in to us. Um, Peter, do you want to read us one of the questions from Callum? Given the Flames are retooling, should we try and trade up our picks, including the 28th, to a smaller group of better prospects or cast as wide a net as possible, potentially acquiring even more picks by trading assets or trading down? You know, I'll go with this first. I think that um, from the price we've seen today to move up in the draft, it wasn't worth it. I mean, we saw a team move up by one. And it cost, a, it cost them a third-round pick to do that. Earlier today, we saw uh, Montreal and L.A. Uh, Montreal moved, what, five picks, and it cost second and seven. It's not a bad idea, but with the cost of what we're seeing on the floor today, I don't want the Flames to give up an asset to move up. Matt, what do you think? Well, and especially with uh, how the draft is proceeding, I think it right now it does not make any sense to move up. They've also got a ton of picks next year. They've got some picks in 2026. So I think that moving an asset now to get another pick 
you need to spread those out too. We can't have all the picks in one draft. We need to slowly bring those guys in the organization. And I mean, even with the Markstrom deal, they brought in a 2025 pick. So that gives us another pick next year. I think you'll see some guys move to the deadline this year, um, and they'll probably get a 2025 or 2026. So I think the price to move up on the floor, I get what Callum wants to do, um, but I think the price to move right now is not worth it. And I would rather they take some of those picks and put them into 2025, 2026, 2027 and keep those covered stock. Exactly, and with the Flames having a rather empty cupboard of uh, prospects at the moment, uh, you, you need to restock that as soon as possible. And um, it, the more darts you can throw at the board at this point is the important thing because you don't know which of these guys is going to necessarily turn out to be your next star player. Exactly. And what's uh, Callum's second pick? Or second question? Are there any under-the-table deals slash promises that happen when a son of a member of the team's front office is set to be drafted? Is it bad etiquette to steal a player like Teach a pick or two ahead of the Flames? I think in the first round, it's every man for themselves. You'd hate to save a guy, quote-unquote, for the Flames, and that becomes a franchise-changing player. Right? A guy that you say, wow, if we had him, we could have won a cup. Round four, round five, round six, sure, maybe you save it for that GM. And there's stories of, you know, guys that have done that for where, okay, it's round five, four, round five, we'll save it for that GM. But in round one, you'd hate to be the GM that, oh, well, we say, quote-unquote, save Teach for the Flames, and then they won the cup and we didn't and we could have had them. So um, bad etiquette? I don't know. And, I mean, we've talked about this today and we've talked about this before as well. doesn't mean that player will never be here, right? just means maybe they're not drafted here. I don't think that, you know, Utah is now the sworn enemy of Craig Conroy or Jerome McGinley or anything like that. But, I, I, again, I get what he's saying, but I would hate it if my GM did that. Right? Oh, we're going to leave him for the other guy. you got to take the best player. Yeah, and it would be a lot different if, like, again, it was like a third round or fourth round yeah. rated player. Well, it's which like, everybody would be like, it's like Sutter's kid in the fourth round, right? Yeah, exactly. Or like uh, Mark Ambrose's mm -hmm. kid getting picked as a pick um, in that draft year. Uh, literally, a and, you know, things like that make sense. In the first round, though, you know, every man for themselves. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and it certainly wasn't a reach at six for him to go there. No, it wasn't. And, you know, they, I mean, he he probably won't. He could pull an Eric Lindros, refuse to play and get traded. I mean, I don't think that's going to happen, but it could. But, yeah, I think you also know when you're in the first round, much as Teach would probably like to come to Calgary, He's probably going to have better opportunities in Utah. They have a good young team and some of that. So that player does, in some cases, probably want to go to where dad is or whatever, but they also want to go where they can make a mark and make you know more impact and become that impact player. And I, I think it's going to be a good market for Tiege. It's not often that we do see second-generation players in the first round, but, I mean, if we go by that too, the Flames wouldn't have drafted a Chuck. He would have gone to St. Louis, and our franchise would have been different, right? So we don't want... We wouldn't want to do it, so we wouldn't want someone else to do it at the same time. Um, so thanks for those questions, Callum. It's too bad you couldn't be here, but thanks for sending those in. Matt, one, one other thing I did want to talk to you about before the 28th pick is the change to the assistant coaches here. Uh, Mark Savard came to the Flames about this time last year. It lasted one year as their playoff coach, and now he's out. We found out on June 23rd, uh, this past Sunday, that he's actually gone to Toronto to work with Craig Berube, who's now their new head coach. Only lasted one season. He was the PP coach. Flames didn't have a great power play. I don't blame a lot of that on the coach. I think a lot of that's on the players that they had on the power play. I mean, yeah, this is a bad you, team. And you could see that, like, once they got Kuzmenko, magically the power play got to be really good. Yeah. Um, you need people who can actually do things creatively with the puck, which that's the reason why the Flames were picking them this year. Uh, they just didn't have very many people that could fill that position. Yeah, and I, I think the coach is the easy guy to change. Not only the Flames necessarily fired him, I think he wanted to go work with Barube. And even the way that it was said by the team is they mutually agreed to a release. So I think it was mutual. But in his place, the Flames have brought in Brad Larson. Brad Larson has been head coach at the HL level with, uh, with uh, San Antonio. He's been a head coach with Columbus. He's been an assistant coach with Columbus. He's, he has more professional experience than Mark Savard does. I really like him coming into this team. I think... You want as many guys as you can with some head coaching experience. You want those guys that know how to run a bench, even if they're not going to run the bench. And I think that he he's going to be doing the, it sounds like the, the penalty kill instead of the power play, and Cale McLean will now be in charge of power play. But I think just a good, solid addition to this coaching staff. Yep, and because of the fact that he has NHL coaching experience, 
uh, if for whatever reason, like, they have a viable alternate if need be. Possibly should get fired. Or if he should pull a Jim Playfair, freak out, snap a stick on the bench and get thrown out. Yes, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I, I think he's... And then he's, throw the bench, too. That's right. Yeah. He's, I, 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 Gully threw the stick, too, at practice one time. So they've had that as a recent history. Um, Another reason why I'm glad that the Oilers lost in the finals. <laughs> Gully didn't throw any sticks. Exactly. But, you know, I think the more you can bring in those guys... And I, I think that, you know, I think Savard is a good coach. He has a lot of a, a OHL experience. I think maybe he would have been a better coach at the AHL level because of that. Um, if he wants to go to Toronto, great. It's not like we're losing a, a great coach there. I think he's a good coach, but I think he's easily replaceable. And it's nice to see guys wanting to come to Calgary, right? Like, this is not a team that's doing well. I'm sure Brad Larson could have got a job elsewhere. So nice to see them wanting to be part of that coaching staff. Yep, and for right now, the Flames just need to focus on drafting and development. Um, and having coaches that reflect that yeah. as well. And a, a, an AHL coach, right? A guy who has AHL experience, and I think he's going to be able to help bring some of those guys up and know what it takes to bring them up from the AHL to the NHL. Yeah, and that, similarly, like with Huska, like one of the things that he's always been renowned for is his ability to uh, develop defensemen specifically and teach them how to he's be... He's got another one to work with. Yes. So... You know, it, it makes sense for where the team's at to have a coach like that as a good teacher for yeah. the young guys to come up. And, you know, when you have a rookie coach like Huska, there's oftentimes not a lot of veteran guys that want to come work with that rookie, right? They want to run their bench, and they're coming in hoping that that guy will get fired and they'll take over in that kind of associate role. So it's nice to see that Huska's getting some respect in a way, and those veteran guys are wanting to come work with him. I think that says something about Huskets. It sounds hard to judge outside your own market how your coach is perceived around the league. I still think that Huska is not necessarily the right coach forever, but he's the right coach where the Flames are right now. I don't know if he's the guy that will lead them to the Stanley Cup eventually, but he's the guy that I think right now is going to lead them into and out of this rebuild. Yeah, and I think at a later date, like when the Flames hired Daryl to take over, um, like they needed a veteran guy to come in that had a pedigree of oh, being a winning coach yeah. to you know sort out the team and like either take them to that next level or not, and the team responded accordingly. And, and by the time they're ready for that guy again, Brett Sutter will be retired and they can bring in Daryl's kid. Yes, exactly. So, and uh, you know, like it's one of those where like when the Flames are ready for that again, like you'll see them go after. Another of the top tier coaches, I'm sure. It's just, we're not at that stage yet. I agree. So, Matt, we are at pick 23 in the draft right now. Um, we saw the Flames take a defenseman earlier. There's been a lot of players that have gone since then. Based on who's still on the board, what do you expect the Flames are going to do with this 28th pick? I would be not surprised if they went on another for another defenseman and go double D in the first round. Um, Stan Solberg is still on the board, which is the player that I would like the most of the remaining D-men. Uh, and if and you're watching, it looks like Trilivi might be making a trade, which is in his nature. But, sorry, um, yeah, Solberg would be a good one. Who else outside of Solberg do you think would be viable? Uh, there are a number of good forwards available still, um, if I, they decide to go that route. I think you're right, though. A D-man makes sense. I mean... We've got a lot of wingers. There's not a lot of great centers left. If you're looking at a centerman, I think you're getting somebody else Zari level at this point. And yeah. they've got a couple of those guys. So I think they need a D-man. Yeah, like there was a couple of guys like uh, Green Tree and uh, Bedouin that we were kind of not overly thrilled with in our uh, preview show that were available. And All right, it looks like Toronto's made a trade. And True, Living, True Living seems to like to trade his draft picks. We don't know exactly what the trade is, but we're about to find out. I don't know what it is with Tree, but it's like he's allergic to picking on the first round. We found that when he was in Calgary, too. It'd be interesting to see if uh, the Flames might be involved with this trade. <laughs> I, I don't know who else he's going to want from this roster. Anderson. I think, yeah, I don't know. I think it's going to be more than that. I heard someone say Nazem Kadri. He's got a no trade. I don't know if he wants to go back to Toronto. We'll find out as, as we wait for the commissioner to announce the trade. Toronto trade pick number 23 in this year's draft to Anaheim in exchange for picks 31 and 58. So, again, going back to um, Callum's question earlier, right, another expensive move up to go from where we had 24 to 31 and the 58th pick included. I mean, that's a second-round pick to move 
about 10 spots, not even. Yeah, so it's eight a, spots up. Yeah, so it's expensive to move this year in the draft, as we're seeing. So, you know, based on those prices, I'm glad Calgary's not trying to move up. I don't think there's anybody in there that is good enough that I'd want to pay that fee. But obviously, Anaheim disagrees. And it makes sense, right? I mean, Anaheim's more of a rebuilding team than Calgary. They're trying to get a couple young assets. Well, and especially Anaheim's a little further in their rebuilding process. So, like, if there is a specific guy they want, it makes more sense to use the, their draft capital to move up to get the guy they want. Yeah. Yeah, so interesting move there at 23. Um, Matt, you say often, Flames need to take a goalie every year. This is not the year to use your first, any of your seconds, probably even your thirds on a goalie this year. I mean, we've got two seconds, two thirds, two fourths. Well, this particular year's goalie market is not very good. Um, like, there's no expected goalies to go in the first three rounds, period. So, so your sixth? So, if the Flames are going to use a goalie, it could probably be the very last pick that the Flames have. Which is, as of now, number 170 in the sixth round. They don't have their seventh this year. So yeah, yeah, and uh, honestly, this would be a year where if the Flames don't take a goalie, that'd be perfectly fine. Yeah, I think that there might be, I mean, they've got some young guys coming through. Um, but yeah, if they don't take one, they've got a ton of picks in the future. And frankly, I think that like with having Wolf coming up and looking like an NHL goaltender, that like if they're going to spend draft capital on another goalie, they should go for like an Askarov or you know like a first round caliber goalie. Yeah, and we and as we talked about earlier too, they have Bodar, who is still a young goaltender. Yeah, he's and only twenty six. Both of those guys turn out. They've got great goaltending capital there. You know. So, yeah, you don't really need another young goalie right now. It's probably better to take the right one than just to take one at this point. Mm -hmm. But I can't see them taking one outside of those last three picks, the two-fourths or the sixth. Also interesting this year, if you look at it, the Flames draft both 106 and 107. Two picks in a row, which you don't see that often. Um, and that's because of the Vancouver Lindholm trade. The bad thing about this year's draft is that they had the conditions from Vegas and from Dallas in the San and Anaheim trade. Neither one turned into the best it could have been. From the Vegas, uh, sorry, Vancouver deal, we could have got another third. From the Dallas deal, and they could have moved up to a second. And the Vegas, they could have moved up to and didn't. So even though they've got a ton of picks, this is almost the worst. Ah, the guy ever. I wanted, Stan Silberg, went. There you go. But would you want to pay the price to move oh, no. up to get him? Um, right, like that would have cost us. I may, I understand why Anaheim did it, and it's yeah. a great selection for them. That probably would have cost the Flames their 62nd pick, the Tanev pick. Yeah, and not worth it where the Flames are at. But yeah, disappointing for me personally, but uh, perfectly fine with that. And while we're waiting on pick 28 here, let's fast forward to uh, the end of long weekend. July 1st, free agency opens. What do you see the Flames, if anything, doing between now and Monday? Oh, honestly, I would not be surprised if the Flames still took, uh, you know, like a bad contract for a future. You think that happens before Monday? Uh, possibly. Like, teams kind of know exactly what there is their own plan. And, uh, you know, it, it gets into crunch time. Like, because of the quick turnover from the finals to the draft to yeah. the free agency, like, I think that, like, over the next few days, you'll start to see. I think it'll either happen in the next few days or, like, the second or third is somebody gets signed and everything goes, now we're jammed up with contract money. We need to make a quick move. Yeah. And I think that the Flames will be the team to go to. Yeah. I and, mean, like, realistically, for free agency, like, the Flames might need a forward and a defenseman and maybe a third string goaltender, but I don't see anything. No, and, and those probably won't be signings made on Monday, on the first. Like, yeah, like the only guy I could see them signing day one is DeBrusque if they're going for him. Yeah, and I think a lot of guys that come here, especially older guys that are looking to rehab a little bit, they're going to want to listen to other possible options first. Yeah. So they're going to wait first, second, third to see those options. You might not even see Calgary get a veteran like that until August. Yeah. Right? This could be a slow process for the Flames. You wait till. I mean, even Nazem Kadri didn't sign until late August, mid-August. Yeah. Um, so you might see something like that where there's a guy who thinks he's going to go, he isn't getting the deal he wants, finally says, okay, I'll go to Calgary for a year or two to, you know, get a short-term deal with more money and stop, you know, after that and hope I can get a better deal. But 
Um, yeah, I, I, I'm thinking Monday is going to be uneventful for this team. Yeah, like literally the only guy I could see day one would be the cross. I don't see any quick no. emergency. I mean, as much as I think they'll bring in a veteran goalie, I think, again, that veteran goalie, oh, we have another trade, um, is going to probably not come until later once all the teams have their two goalies in place. All right, let's see. Colorado trades pick number 24 in this year's draft to Utah. It picks number 38 and 71. So, again, you know, a high price, two seconds for a first. That, and, that and seems a, like a cheaper price. And like a second. Well, it's, it's 14 picks up for just a third round And pick. a pick next year. So, ah. a second next year, second this year, and a third. So, but, again, a fairly high price to move into the late first in this year's draft. That's a lot. The, little bit yeah, the, the Rangers year. second next year. Um, so that's what two seconds and a third to move into a late first. So yeah, I mean, it's I'm surprised how expensive it is to move this year, especially for a draft year. Everyone's just kind of marginally happy with it seems like. Um, so the Utah has acquired the 24th pick for the for the Avalanche's 38th, 71st, and New York's second next year. And that's also board. why I wouldn't be opposed to the plan trading down from 28. Yeah. So if you can get something well, that's like it. that if kind you of could, return, If you get not? a deal like that and get another second and third to move down, why not? What's the furthest you'd be willing to probably move out of 28? Uh, down to uh, like 41 where our oh, second wow. round pick is. Okay. Just depends on what the return is. Yeah, I mean, you've still got a couple seconds, so it's not like you need another second. But yeah, if you get three seconds, and we've done well with second round picks in the past. I We've got our first rounder. This is kind of the icing on the cake at this point. I'm honestly surprised that the Flames are going to be making, it looks like, this 20th pick. I expected them to either trade it for a roster player. I mean, we've heard Trevor Zegers' name thrown around. and guys. Like I would, uh, personally, I would hate that because I don't like Zegers. Um, just I think he's too cocky for how good of a player he is. He might get humble if he comes to a bad team, but yeah. Yeah, it, it just uh, a lot that rubs me the wrong way about but, him as a player. Yeah, I mean, there's other guys like that that, you know, you could put in a similar mold who I thought they might trade out of the first round for. But at this point, I'm assuming they're going to make that pick. We're four picks away, we'll find out. Yeah, it's one of those that, like, it depends on, like, where exactly, like, the Flames have tiers in their mm -hmm. list. Because, like, if there's no difference between, like, say, 25 and 30 to 5 for their picks in their list, and yeah. they can get an additional asset, like, why not? And I think the thing fans have to remember with 28th pick, I mean, we're used to picking late, but these picks need time to develop, right? This guy's not going to be a guy that's going to be on the roster next year or the year after. This is a guy that's probably going to play his full junior career. Um, and probably two and years. And probably a couple years with the Wranglers before you even see him in the NHL. Hey, just look at Connor Zari. Like, it took until he's yeah. 22, 23. Yeah, another guy. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, like, all of these guys are going to be, like, the 22, 23, exactly, 24 yeah. before they even make the NHL. So I think that whoever they end up taking with the next pick, be it at 28 or later, this is a guy we're going to have to have some patience with, right? And we often see rebuilding teams, and while well, the Flames are not using that word, we often see them bring that first-round pick directly onto their roster. Um, I don't think that's what we're going to see here. I think this is going to be a, a long play to get this guy developed. You know my thoughts on Sam Bennett. I think the Flames rushed Sam Bennett to the NHL. Even if we look at a guy like um, Backlund, right? He came up for years. Fans wanted to trade him because they wasn't looking good. And it took him a while to figure out who he was. And so I think there's some high-profile Flames there that have come on the roster too early. And they well, and even Backlund's case, like he didn't really make his NHL debut until he was like 21 either. Yeah. 21, 22. But even then, I mean, you know, if he was a top player, fans, I think one would be more offensive because he was a top pick, and he's really turned out to be a great defensive center, but fans are expecting these top prospects to always be your number one, number two guys um, when you're picked in the first round, second round, and they're not, right? So we need to be, I think we need to be patient with both these picks, but if, uh, ben, especially for the Flames take at 28. Ah, I got a we both in one. Cole Bedwin, not coming here, which is good, going to Utah. He gets to play with Teach. And we'll get to see Utah's terrible all-black jersey again. Yes, Dallas, I mean Utah. Which is not the one they're going to wear. The Angels revealed the one they're going to wear. It's a blue jersey. But I guess they didn't have him ready for this, would be my guess. 
But I mean, I could probably go to Sport Check and find a better jersey to throw the letters Utah on for one night in their beer league section. So it's got to be in rush for these guys going to Utah. You don't really know anything about the city. You don't know anything about where they're going. This is all new to these guys. I do like the presentation we're seeing. I like the way they're using the sphere. I like that the stage is lighting up in each team's colors. Yeah, like it, honestly, if the NHL wanted to just keep it in Vegas at the sphere every year, like that would be perfect. Mm -hmm. I'm not a huge fan of the showgirl, but I get it. It's Vegas. But, you know, I mean, it, it's, I would say this is probably the best show I've seen of the draft in a while. I think so, Al was saying earlier it felt like a hotel conference room um, most years, right? Just the folding tables on the ground. This is, this feels big. Like, it's, a, it's probably the biggest feeling draft we've had in a while. Oh, wow, these guys knew they wanted better one. They even have his, his number printed on their black jersey. So, some plan to take this guy to potentially move up and get him, I guess. But, yeah, I mean, look at this jersey. This is just a black jersey. I know. It's a little bit better than the Winnipeg's uh, draft. Well, Winnipeg's Winni Winni had the, the NHL logo, logo on it. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much the same thing, but with Utah on the front. All right, well, we, it looks like you're going to commercial, and then we'll have pick 25. Uh, Matt, I guess as we look ahead to free agency, we we've already talked a little bit about um, about Chillington. Another guy that's yet to be signed, AJ Greer. Do you think AJ Greer comes back? I would like him back. I think the management would like him back, but I think he wants to be on a better team. I think he's going to want to kind of wait and see what he can get for a deal and come back if no one else brings him in. Yeah, I would not expect him back. Even yeah, and I mean, really, the Flames went without him for so long in the year. I think mean, they've shown that other guys were able to step into a similar role. Is there anybody else in this year's roster, either by trade, I guess at this point by trade, that you think aren't going to be here? Uh, not really, unless uh, like a certain player asks for a trade. Uh, uh, you know, like say like a, a Coleman or yeah. a Padre. I think Walker Dewar could get demoted. That's the only other guy because he didn't yeah. look great. Uh, we've seen Ka we've seen. Manji Penny leave, Senshi Dubé is gone. You know, I think there's guys we'll see promoted, but no one I think will be demoted at this point. Yeah. Um, they lost a Hochu, the defenseman they brought in. He's going to the KHL, but that wasn't the guy they were really planning on having anyways. Yeah, it was an audition to see if he was worth keeping. And, and they maintain his rights if he wants to come back. Yeah. But I think they really need to go out and get a defenseman, and I think they need to go out and get a centerman. Um, and we'll see what they can do with those. It's going to be a challenging year to bring those pieces in, though, because who wants to come to Calgary? Yeah. Right? Well, and realistically, like, the Flames are going to be the NHL bumping ground yep. of bad contracts. Like, that, that's, like, the Flames are realistically the only team that has actual cap space and willingness to use and it. And even being a dumping ground, they're kind of screwed next year because they have a top ten pick, likely, that's going to go to, to Montreal. Not to Calgary. Well, only if they're outside the top ten. So is it top ten protected next year as well? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, if it's the Flames are picking one to ten, uh, they get Florida's pick instead, which should be like twenty eight to thirty. Yeah, and then they and then Calgary will have uh, Jersey's pick. Yeah, as well. So, so they'll still have a couple picks there, but. Yeah, I think if they're going to get a center, like one, that's I, where, like that's the reason why, like tanking a bit this year makes a lot more sense. Just as yeah. long as we're in the top ten. We're good, because we're getting our pick, and it's all good. We're seeing on TV now, Jerome McGinley and TJ McGinley together, something we're not going to see here in Calgary. But, Matt, you know, we are talking about free agents. Um, you mentioned Jeff Skinner as a potential target for the Flames, maybe to take a cap dump. I think that's going to be how they're going to have to find the centerman. Yeah. I think, you know, Jeff Skinner could be that guy. I think that there will be free agents around. If, if you think that Shillington might come back as your top four with Ball, I think you've got a, a capable enough 5-6 with the other pieces they've got. I think even if Shillington doesn't come back, you can probably find that top four or they'll move Merrimanov into that. Honestly, as a player, um, I think that Merrimanov 
basically does everything that Chillington does, but is also bigger and more physical. Yeah. So I wouldn't be necessarily opposed if the Flames just kind of let Chillington go. Yeah, I can see that too. Um, because they could use more size in general on the back end and maybe get a, a more Tanev type guy. Um, Is there any chance Tanev comes back? No. No, he's going to get paid as a free agent. Oh, yes. <laughs> as an old guy, I think he's going to be one of the older guys that gets snapped up early and gets a big deal. Yeah, I would not be surprised if Toronto didn't you know, find a way to like four years and four million or some stupid. You know, and, and I mean, teams like Calgary have a lot of money. We've talked about them acquiring somebody. I think we might also see Calgary taking on a broker position here, right, where they're going to take on half of somebody's money or something like that in a trade. We saw both of the Calgary trades at the deadline go through a broker. So I think, you know, even if they're not acquiring that $30 million directly, I think you might see them, okay, we got to essentially be the money launderer of the NHL, right? Clean, clear some money and clean some money and send on somebody else. Well, the Flames can only actually do that once this year because we're retaining for Markstrom, so... Can't you have three? No, it's only two. It's only two? Okay. Yeah. So, so even if they do one then, I mean, make your one count. Yeah. And, like, if you look at, like, Kuzmenko and Sharon Govich, if the Flames have to deal them at the deadline, they're not making a ton of money. So no. you could flip them without needing to retain. For sure. Yeah, I don't think you'd have to retain either one of those guys. I mean, I, the Flames probably would, just like Marshall, if they have to. But yeah, and it's one of those with the, like they're cheap enough where they could easily take back a insert. Shen go to what three and a half? Three point one, I do believe. So I, I think a lot of goes like five ish. Yeah, I think a lot of teams would happily take on the three one for Sharon Govich. Yeah. All right, so we have Boston picking the twenty five. Flames are twenty eight, so we're a couple picks away from that. Matt, do you see, I mean, we've seen a little bit of movement today. Do you see much movement happening with draft picks tomorrow? We generally uh, there don't are always, There always are a few, but like five or six in total. And it's like if somebody is wanting like a, to move up in the fourth, they might throw like a seventh. And often it's not for the same year. It's like, hey, yeah. we want to move up this year, but we'll give you next year's. Oh, they took Dean Letourneau, the big giant guy, and Jankowski. I like their graphic they're doing. Where they sort of, you know, bring them off the board and show them. It, it's a, it's a cool presentation this year. That makes sense a lot for Boston because, you know, they can be patient with the big giant guy from the really terrible league. Yeah, and you know it's interesting too, right? Because if you get picked by one of the top teams, you're going to a top team, but it also means there's less opportunity. Yeah. And so it's been the weird thing in the draft. You know, people say, well, who wants to go play for San Jose? A lot of opportunity, right? You're going to get that opportunity there. You're not going to get it in Boston. You're not going to get it in Vancouver. You're not going to get it in a lot of those places. So th there's pros and cons to going early and going late. Matt, between now and rookie camp, what do you think? The, do you see any other big transformations happening with this team? Uh, not really. Maybe another addition or two but not anything uh, you mentioned, shattering. You mentioned Sharon Govich and Kuzmenko. There's been talk of the Flames flipping Kuzmenko. I don't see why any team would want to take him right now. I mean, he had a good second half, but he's also been really inconsistent before that. I think if he gets traded, it's at the deadline. Yeah, I don't see any reason why a team would take him. Unless, like, you know, it's sort of like the Montepone situation, where if you get the, the price you're asking, of course you make the trade, but uh, I don't a, see yeah. any need for that. Right and the now. Flames got lightning in the bottle once by being able to move Mangiapane and not retain. Yeah, and I don't see that value. happening again. No. Yeah. Do you think that uh, we will see Sharon Govich ink to a deal if he's going to come back for the beginning of the season, or do you think this is very much like last year where Connie says, if you don't have a deal by the start of the season, we're looking to move you? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I, I do not expect any of the impending UFAs to come back. Um, I think that... Uh, they're going to be wanting to move on as well. So, like, I don't think that, especially from the uh, garbage bag day, the quotes from Sharon Govich, he very much was hesitant about talking about re-signing. So it, yeah. it, it, it's one of those that usually that, that gives you a good indication of where the player's mind's at. Yeah, and, I mean, it's an emotional day too. Who knows? I mean, we've heard stuff change from one garbage bag day to the next season before. And Sharon Govich, while he's a decent player, I don't think that, like, say, four years from now when he's, like, 31, is going to be a player that you're necessarily going to be wanting on your team. No, either. and I mean, I don't think Conroy's going to hire anyone or sign anyone for more than three years, four years maybe at this point. 
I think Sharon Govich could be a good depth guy. I don't think he's going to be your top six at 31. And I think they're going to have to manage the money accordingly. And, and I think he's going to be a guy that's going out looking for more cash. Well, exactly. And, you know, you're looking at, like, he got how many goals last year yeah. in the 30s. And, you know, if he repeats that, which he probably will, because he's going to be the first-line center for the team, that, you know, if you're – going to see like a number starting with a seven or an eight on a six or seven year deal for that guy. If yeah. He, if he, if he repeats. You know, and I wouldn't want that. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think he's worth it. I don't know if he's, yeah, I don't know if he's going to go for that much. I mean, it, he could, like he if could. he throws up back to back 30 goal seasons, like that's, yeah, he, he's going to get paid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know if he'll get the same numbers because I don't know who he's going to play with. We'll see. It'll probably be Uber and then a name, speaking of Huberto, that's been thrown out is Anthony Declare, his former winger in Florida. What do you think the likelihood is that Declare comes in? A uh, good possibility, because Declare kind of bounced around. And... He's also, he's kind of in the back half of his career, too. So I could see him wanting to come in here. Try know, and play those numbers play, again. Play with Huberto, yeah. get those numbers up, even if it's on a one- or two-year deal to say, you know what, let's come in, let's go back with the guy that got me to where I was. And let's see if we can get those numbers up and, uh, you know, get a bigger deal when we're done. It's almost like the uh, Wayne Simmons deal for a few years, right, where you're trying to sign cheap deals to get those numbers up. Yeah. Not really Never bad. really worked. Yeah. And and I think if Duclair did come in, I mean, that's going to then move somebody off the first line. But, again, wingers being displaced, right? We talked about this earlier. The Flames have a glut of wingers. They're going to need to find a way to either move one for a center or just find a centerman. There's really nobody right now in, like you want to say Stockton, but there's no one on the Wranglers that kind of would be that centerman. So I think someone's going to have to come in as a free agent or, um, you know, free agent signing for that. It'll be interesting to see what they end up doing with that position. Because really you've got what? You've got Kadri, maybe you've got Zari or Sharon Govich. I think they could play one of them at the center, but not both of them. Yeah. And then you've got Backlund. Exactly. So and you, two, might maybe need, three centers. you might need a fill in, you know, like Kevin Rooney. Fourth yeah, well, there. Rooney will be back. So that's like your. So you've almost got like one, Backlund, three, and four, and you're missing your two. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see what the Flames end up doing there. It looks like the Kings are going up to pick with their new jersey, going back to their old look from the mid 90s. When I heard the Kings were changing their look, I really hoped they were going to go back to purple and yellow. Yeah, same here. But I don't mind this jersey. I think the stripe up the bottom is a little big, though. Well, it looks a little out of place. Was it reverse retro where they wore this 90s logo with the purple color? Yeah, I think so. Yes. I think that was one of the reverse retro ones. Trying to sort of blend your... There he earlier. is. And Rob Blake on stage, too. So you've got two former Leafs, or sorry, two former Kings on the stage to make the pick. And who's off the Liam board Green now? Tree. Green Tree. You thought the Flames might take him at 28. So numbers are dwindling a little bit for who's going to be available for the Flames in two picks. We have Carolina, and then we have the Flames making their pick at 28. Not, not a, a great deal of guys left on the board that are interesting. Kind of getting into the steam picking mode now, so uh, that's why I like it wouldn't be a both of the flames decided to trade down. But you need a just, partner, right? And I don't know who's going to want to trade up. Yeah. Can't just bestow your pick on somebody. Here, we're stealing your picks. Thou uh, shalt give me a third for this pick. <laughs> um, you need to have a trade partner, and you know, it, it, speaking of trade partners, I looked it up. The Flames have now done, I think, three deals with New Jersey in one year. It's like the Flames in New Jersey now are becoming very familiar bedfellows. And even uh, New Jersey did, I forget if it was the Tanev deal or the Hannafin deal, but they absorbed half the contract on that too. So there's the Sharon Govich deal, there was the Markstrom deal, there was that deal. They made quite a number of trades in one year. It's a little weird, but it happens. And then the, yeah. The, you, you get temporary friends for a year or two. That's not a bad looking Kings jersey. I like the the shiny silver on it. Yeah, if the white part of the jersey was a little shorter, like an inch shorter, 
I think like that'd be a perfect jersey. And, and I think as Fanatics takes over, we will probably see some small changes to these. Anybody want to predict how bad the first year Fanatics going to be? Are we going to have see-through jerseys? Are we going to have them just tearing randomly? Jerseys just ripping, who knows? Are we going to have the wrong colors out there? Or as soon as the equipment manager washes them, the, the red fades? Well, like, uh, there was one baseball player in spring training where his pants and pocket literally ripped down to his knee and his mom called him literally while he was in the logo saying, I've washed your clothes since you were a, you know, a small child and not once a pair of your pants ever. Well, in the NHL, they often have pants shells, so that'll be easy to fix. But, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the Fanatics jerseys. If you watch the, have you watched the preview jerseys that they sh or the preview video they put up for the new jerseys? They show somebody quality assurance testing every jersey, and I think that's probably Fanatics' way of showing that we understand some of the criticisms. Yeah. Because every jersey is shown being quality tested. And I think that... But like the Rangers, where it's R-A-N. Oh, yeah, the weird turning. No, but they show somebody like folding the arms over and looking at the back of each jersey. So I think they know some of those criticisms. But yeah, the Rangers one looked weird. The Kearney's off. I hope they fix up before the season starts. There was talk for a while of having a flames jersey with the Rangers. It had flames going down it, but then they tested it. And the guys had their arm over it. It said lanes. They didn't put it out there. That's why they had the Calgary one yeah, the, with the, the script. Weird, uh, one with the, uh, the cow jersey. Yeah, the Cowboy yeah, script. Every time the I think they wore in one. They wore in one practice, and they're like, "Yeah, we can't have this." So um, it's never seen the light of day. But I'm told that there's concepts out there that has flames. Yeah, Conroy color. was mocking it in the reveal. It's like, uh, yeah, that, that was our idea initially. No. <laughs> and I think that's when they quickly pivoted to the script font, which still is my least favorite Flames logo, but not a bad concept. Like yeah. the the colors, the striping. It was not a bad idea. Yeah, it's like they took like parts of like five different jerseys and just made the same new jerseys. Like the reverse uh, retros. They still are. That's been my issue for years. It's like the two and the five is just flipped upside down. Yeah, all all the black jerseys they have them in that script too. That they're upside down. And maybe not the. Oh, not that one. The reverse. The reverse. The reverse retro one is, and yeah, all the black uh, C ones were, but we talked about that on the show for a while, like 25 is just the same number twice. It's, exactly, yeah. Yeah, and, and there's, yeah, Hannafin's too, and he's 55. It could have been 22 if you looked down upside down. It's a, it's a really weird script that they used, but um, yeah, hopefully, you know, I think that we will start to see Fanatics jerseys change. I think you'll see the Flames with new uniforms, but I don't think it'll be until they're in the new building. Yeah, I, I do like uh, Matt Dumba, though, for the league having a new 55 for another year, so it's really possible to back there for another year. Another year. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said it, and the NHL's like, yeah, you got to change your number if you never wear your 55 again. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of numbers for the Flames, um, the Flames... Flames brought in Kevin Ball, who's worn 88 forever. He was supposed to officially change his number to 7 because Mon Mangiapane is wearing 88. Now Mangiapane has gone. I wonder if they give him his number back. Like, they've got a bunch of blank 88s now. He can have the number back if they make him stay at 7. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see there. And it looks like we have yet another trade. And this is uh, when there's always one time in the first during a trade when Batman pretty much admits the fans are booing him, and this seems to be the one. Carolina trades the 27th pick in this year's draft to Chicago for picks 34 and 50. So again, quite a high price to pay to move into that first. Yeah, and like if the Flames were to trade our picks, well, I'd be perfectly great with that kind of return. Yeah, well, and, and again, you got to wonder, I mean, if these guys didn't do it, they'd probably call the Flames over the next pick. Trying to make the same deal because obviously they like somebody there. But yeah, I, I don't want to pay the price to move up, but if someone wants to pay us for the 28th pick, we'll see. I'm surprised. I'm honestly surprised there hasn't been an NHL body moved on the floor. Usually there's also, you know, players being traded, but tonight it's all just been picks pick, moved. Yeah. yeah. So we'll see if that changes tomorrow. I think, I think that there's going to be less players traded between now and Monday with the salary cap going up more than teams thought it would. 
right? We thought maybe a million or two, but it's going up to 88 million from 82 million. So I think that more teams are like, okay, we have some breathing room here that we weren't expecting to have. The Flames with 30 million of more breathing room than are allowed. They're actually under the cap floor right now. Yeah, so the, the Flames are basically like, hey, everybody, this is figured out your mess. Uh, maybe, this, uh, maybe this is why Shillington's waiting. He's like, all right, guys, you're going to pay me to just stay cap compliant. This is going to be a, a good time for A.J. Greer to be looking for a contract. Pay the man to stay cap compliant. But, I mean, even if they do that, though, then that sets up a bad dichotomy, right? Because the next guy comes in and says, well, he's making this, I want more. We've seen teams do that, and it's like, well, he's only getting paid because of the cap. So we, we can't have that. So we've got Chicago making their pick, and then Calgary's up for 28, and um, that's almost the end of the first round here. When Calgary originally made this pick with Lindholm, did you expect it was going to be this late? No, but uh, I, I'm just glad. We kind of knew it would be somewhere in the 20s. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's been years we've had zero firsts, right? It's not not very often we've had two, especially not right now, two picks in the first three years in a row. And it really sucks for Vancouver because both of them were off of walking for all those yeah, I, that they traded them. Yeah, I think they knew they'd both do rentals. Yeah. Lindholm's going to be an interesting guy to watch on free agency day because the rumor was he wanted to deal with Calgary and start with a seven or an eight. He didn't look good this year. I think Vancouver is probably looking for the same numbers. I don't know what I'd give him at this point, maybe a three or a four. But again, I think he's a guy that may not sign July 1st, waiting for the deal to come in that he's looking for. And he might be a guy that, I mean, I right now I think it would be a bad optical piece for the Flames to retread players like that. But he's the kind of guy I could see not being signed on the 10th of July and calling the Flames saying, hey, can I come back? I'll take your money. But I think optically, if you're saying we're moving on from these guys, say, well, we brought him back because he was cheap, I think, is bad for Conroy optically. Yeah. No, I agree. I think I think you'd find somebody else. But, you know, there's we see it a lot in the NHL where you'd rather dance with the devil you know than the devil you don't, right? You know the player. You know the person. That sort of thing. And who did we get Merrick here? Banneker. Merrick Banneker. So, Flames are the next pick now. Um Overall, we've seen some guys taken in different positions than we expected them. But I don't think that there's really been anyone taken off the board, has there? Not really. Like, like a little bit. Like a, up, a little bit. up a little bit. But like we usually see one pick in the first where they're like with the well, 20th Senek, pick, they're taking like yeah, 41. Or, yeah. Well, Beckett, Senek, he was pretty much a yeah. real but, big riser. But we knew that he'd be in the first round, right? Yes. Like we haven't seen the second round guy taking 10 picks early or something like that. I remember one year Edmonton, and I forget who it was now, but they had like the ninth pick and took the guy that everyone thought was like 41st overall. What are you guys doing here? So we will see who Calgary ends up picking. I like that they're showing footage of these guys on the board, not only their, um, their game footage, but also that they got high enough resolution footage to show on this big screen from the junior teams. This guy does not look happy to be going to Chicago. I don't know. You get to play with Bedard. You can maybe put up some good numbers. All right. Now they... Uh, Emil Timming would be probably the guy I would expect. So we see that this jersey has a name on it, which means they had some idea they might take him. Do you think at 28, the Flames are going to have a name on the jersey, or is it just going to be a generic 24? Oh, uh, they'll probably have a name. Uh, the question was asked earlier, how do they know? The trick of the draft, they actually have Velcro nameplates. They have about uh, five that they've sewn, if, they, if they're going to be in the top five, and then the rest are all Velcro. You swap them out with one year, remember, they were taking the picture with the GM, and he put his hand on the back, and the nameplate fell off. And you can see it was Velcro. I forget what team it was, but that ex oh, was the Flyers. The, it exposed the draft secrets. And that was, I think, the year, like now, they have the contrasting nameplates. It was very obvious it fell off. All right, so uh, who did you say you think the Flyers? I think thing? that the Flames will probably go with Emil Henning. Uh, he's a six foot two wing, right winger. Another winger. Yes. Okay. Uh, just because it's big, he equals good. So. He can can take big, not good. Yeah. But we'll, we'll see. I think 
Daryl Sutter definitely went for the bigger guys. I'm not quite sure what a Craig Conroy player is yet. Well, if you look at last year's draft, it was basically big guy, big guy, big guy. Yeah, but Connie guy. didn't put that list together, right? He came sure. into that list after it was put together by um, Tree and the staff. So we don't really know what a Craig Conroy draft pick is, but the Flames now on the board. We'll see if there's a trade or if they make the pick at 28 once um, this is this guy's been talked to. You'll notice on a lot of these jerseys now, for those that are watching at home, the collars change a little bit. It's a lot rounder collar with Fanatics, and the NHL logo on it is more metallic looking. So that's probably the biggest change you're going to see this year, unless the jerseys start to split or something like that. Thankfully, they don't wear white pants like they do in baseball. I don't understand the little white tabs on the Blackhawks' shoulders. It's kind of weird, but it is. Do you, do you think that it just created the standard for the CPU? Eh, good enough. Yeah, or I mean, in the 80s, you had the white, white yokes. All right, we have four Flame fans that are being interviewed now that are in Vegas near the top of the sphere, it looks like. From Lethbridge all the way to Vegas. Wow, these guys have gone a long way to see T. Jagimla not get picked. <laughs> I bet they'll be at the opening day of the Utah season. You know, it's, it's got to be weird for guys going to Utah, right? They don't know what to expect in the market. They don't know what it's going to be like. Um, it's, it's like when Vegas came in or when Seattle came in. It's a new market, and you're not sure if going there is going to be good for your career, bad for your career. Where anything is. Like, where the good neighborhoods are. Well, I, I mean, they've already got pro sports teams there, so they're going to know some of that stuff. Yes, but normally, like. Yeah, you can talk to a guy who's been there before. Um, they'll talk to the jazz players. Matt, what do you think the Utah name is going to end up being? The Yeti. The Yeti, I think so too. I think as Yeti, long as it's not the stupid outlaws, you know. I think it'll be Yeti like or Mammoth. That, that is the worst name. It's not a double A football game. No, but, you know, I, I can see the outlaws being like the Flames farm team. It wasn't the Wranglers. Yes. No, and that's what it should be. It's the farm team. Yeah. And I feel, yeah, having your first job would be interesting. All right, well, we're about to find out what the Flames pick is going to be. Flames are on the Paul board. Hudson might be interesting too. Uh, Wallenius, uh, I think we talked about. We did, well. yeah. And I think we can see some players as well. So. We shall see what the Flames do here. Craig Conroy, Todd Button going up to the stage, ready to make their pick. The pick is in. All right. Conroy doesn't want to get tempted to talk for 20 minutes again, so he's letting Button make the pick. This is probably a pick that's more the scouts' pick, anyways. The Flames pick from the Lumberjacks. That's uh, USHL team, I believe. Never even heard of the guy. There's there's our off the board pick that we were talking about, right? This is a guy who's I think when I saw him last. I mean, I've seen the name. He's in the USHL. He's got to be NCAA eligible, which means he'll probably be four years till he's even NHL eligible. Yeah, he had 838 goals and 83 points. What school is he committed to? Uh, no idea. Okay. Uh, he's uh, from Russia. Uh, he's six foot one. He's a right winger who shoots left. All right. Well, we got our winger. So we didn't get the double D first like you thought, two defensemen. We got a winger and a D-man. And we'll see what the Flames end up doing tomorrow with their two seconds, two thirds, two fourths, and a sixth. I think for the 2024 draft, that's about it for us. Unless anyone wants to jump in and chat about anything else Flames hockey. We will talk to everybody after the first uh, when, when free agency is over. We want to thank uh, Bradley and the team here at Bow River Brewing for having us and hosting tonight. We want to thank Peter for coming out and making sure that our live show went well. And for everyone that came out to hang out tonight, it's been a lot of fun. We'll talk to you guys after the first. As always, go Flames go, and thank you Panthers.
Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.